On May 23rd, a majority of UN member states voted to recognise July 11th as an international day of remembrance for the Srebrenica genocide. The, war, the civil war in Bosnia, uh, encouraged and facilitated at every step by the US, um, was a bitter, grinding three-year civil, civil conflict that pitted Bosniaks, Croats and Serbs, who'd previously been friends, neighbours and relatives, against one another in a hellish cycle of violence. Srebrenica remains a highly controversial and contested event, and the UN vote appears concerned with cementing the narrative that what happened there was a genocide. Nabozha Malic is a veteran documentarian of the Yugoslav wars of the 90s and uh, the, the collapse of the US empire. Um, he was kind enough to take some time to sit down with me and discuss the geopolitical significance uh, of the Srebrenica vote at the UN. Take a listen. The notorious Nabozha Malic, um, it is an honour. Um, uh, yeah, so um, what's happening at the UN today? Well, the General Assembly got conned into voting for this resolution ostensibly proposed by Rwanda and Germany, uh, the two countries that, whose names are sort of uh, symbolically Synony associated, synonymous, synonymous yes. with genocide. In fact, as the Russian ambassador noted very politely, uh, Germany has no right to take that word into its mouth because the UN was invented to prevent the German genocide of the Jews in World War II. And, Serbs and Russians and others mm. from happening again. Um, but they basically, I mean, it's blatantly obvious that the resolution wasn't written by the Germans or the Rwandans, but they're no. the you know, people who hired them for a purpose. Uh, and I'm looking at Washington and London for this. Mm. Um, and, you know, they, they essentially conned the General Assembly into saying, well, you, you, you all think genocide is bad, right? So therefore vote for this resolution to mm. confirm that you're nice and you hate genocide. And there was all of these, all of this, what was really shocking to me, it was how many countries admitted that they knew exactly what was going on, mm. that they realized that this was all a scam and a ploy, and then they voted for it anyway. Primarily, Such as the UN. Um. <laughs> right. Well, you know, I wasn't really, I was pleasantly surprised by some of the majority Muslim countries mm. who said, well, we'll at least abstain from this because we see what's going on. Mm. But several that should have voted against or been, um, or abstained out of decency chose not to. But in, in any case, this resolution has been, they've been pushing it for months. And in fact, uh, Serbian President Vucic uh, revealed that the, the first proposal for it came two days, two days, 48 hours after the anniversary of the NATO war of 99. And he's like, I was in a security council. Coincidence. Right. I was objecting to this. And all of these <clears throat> Western governments are telling me, oh, well, that's the past. You need to look to the future. And then they turn around and look 29 <laughs> yeah. years in the past, which is a nice round number. No, wait, it isn't. Uh, and decide to go through with this now. Yeah. Because they, I mean, I think that, that that's really shocking. I mean, and it's, it, it's got zero um, media pickup whatsoever, of course. But like, yeah, that there was a planned UN, UN Security Council um, special meeting on uh, the, the criminal uh, bombing of Yugoslavia uh, on the 25th anniversary. Um, the Serbian Prime Minister flew out specially, and then it got sabotaged. By France and and, and Britain, um, yeah. The, I mean, I, I, I was aware of some of the discussions that were being had, like around this. It was very difficult to get to 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 get agreement to have the meeting at all. Um, and this is despite the UN uh, agreeing, sorry, the UN Security Council agreeing to hearings on the false f flag chemical attack in Duma. Like it's it, it, you know it, it's really quite remarkable. So I mean, it also created this this vote in the UN also created a situation whereby um, Iran and Israel agreed for one time. Um, I, uh, can you expand like, on? Well, I mean, it's, it's a Serbian superpower. We can get all sorts of agreements to happen, uh, <laughs> even if it's you know united in hating us or defending yes. us. <laughs> um, but. It's it's really not that mysterious. I actually um, literally made that argument myself. You know, Iran and there's, here's just here's something that both Iran and Israel can agree on. Yes. A month ago. Okay. And I spelled it out and I said, you know, the the, the issue with this is that if an alleged massacre of eight thousand people in a town mm -hmm. can be declared genocide, then anything can be declared genocide. Yeah. And if you can get the uh, general assembly 
to vote one into existence with a simple majority of those present, which is what happened because they didn't get the majority of actual member states, uh, then, you know, who's next? Anybody's next. Anybody who's on the, on the naughty list of the powers that be, you know, to, and Israel certainly can't hope for a, a General Assembly majority. I could imagine that there would be enough people in the General Assembly who might vote against, may, might be persuaded to vote against Iran mm. as well. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there's a decent majority in General Assembly that could be voting against the United States. And this is what people meant by Pandora's box. Once you've established a rule, a precedent, that you can conjure genocide into existence by having a, a, a simple majority of those present General Assembly resolution about it, then everything becomes a genocide. Indeed. And I, be, I believe the sponsors of this resolution are banking on other people not lawfaring them back. We'll see whether that's going to happen or not. <laughs> but in my opinion, looking at the uh, speeches by Russia and China, during the session, I don't think they're joking. I don't, it's, it's no more Mr. Nice Guy from them anymore. I think they've seen this for what it is, and I think they're going to retaliate with lawfare just as well. Because, you know, now that, now that the rule has been established, they're going to use it. It's what, I forget, I always forget which one of these uh, in the Alinsky rule set this is, but make the enemy live up to their, their own set of rules. And that's exactly what they're going to do. They're going to throw it right back at the globalist American empire, which, make no mistake, is behind this. Yeah, indeed. I mean, you say, you say alleged massacre in Srebrenica. Um, can you expand on that? Well, uh, I, I, I could really get bogged down in the weeds here, but it's one of those... Actually, technically, how many people were killed in Srebrenica itself? You ask that from the Hague Tribunal, and they will have to reluctantly and grudgingly admit zero. Uh, yeah, I don't know what narrative people have been fed and what they believe, but... I was in Bosnia at the time. I was monitoring in real time, like media reports filtered yeah. through um, for, from all sides. Uh, I, I even had access to UN briefings at the time, and there was no mention of anything happening in Potocari itself. The Dutch troops that were stationed there literally testified: we didn't see anything happen. Uh, you know, the women and children were you know, they were filmed getting onto these buses and driven to transported to safety. So what ends up being this, the subject of this whole story is the 28th Division of the Army of the Republic of Bosnia-Herzegovina, which is predominantly Muslim, that decides to abandon their women and children and march to Tuzla through Serb-held territory, through minefields, through ravines, through ambush points, through artillery fire, which is composed of, like, it was 98 or 99% of combatants uh, in, in this column and, you know, you, you would be hard-pressed to... Obviously, it would be heartless to say they're a legitimate military target, but that's the legal definition of it. And so you have a case of people testifying, yes, we fought through, we got attacked by artillery, a lot of people died here and there. And then you have, um, I believe, the final amount of bodies they found that were tied up. Mm. That, that had ligatures, right? yeah. uh, was something in the neighborhood of 500 altogether. So people who had been taken prisoner, and at that point, at some point between being after being taken prisoner, executed, which is a war crime, and nobody's denying that. Uh, the Serbs, first of all, like, yep, yeah, this is a war crime, and some of our people did this because it is. But then you fast forward to the ICTY, the the tribunal that was basically funded by the U.S. People say NATO, but it's the U.S. that yeah. did the lion's share, just like NATO. Yeah. And you had their judges <clears throat> and prosecutors essentially conjure these ob obscure tangential legal theories in which this is the only genocide in, in the history of humanity that happened theoretically in one town that did not target non-combatants, that there's no evidence of intent, there's no... Direct, evidence, of an, evidence of an order. Right, there's no order. Any command there, level. There's not a single person who, ever, who was ever tried for ordering it. Mm. All of the people involved were basically like, well, you should have known this was going to happen. Or uh, you were aiding and abetting it by not stopping it. And the defense was like, stopping what? 
you have to prove something was actually happening. Mm. And yet all of these trials were basically like, yeah, well, some people got killed somewhere and we don't know the exact number and you're to blame. Mm. I'm, I'm paraphrasing and I'm obviously painting with a very broad brush. Mm. But if you actually go through the ICTY records, you will find that they've never established a, a, the actual number of people killed or who killed them or where or under what circumstances. It's one of those, you are asserting the existence of a crime, but you're not, docu you're not proving it. Mm. And you've got a, a war crime, you've got the execution of prisoners you can prosecute people over, but no, you, the people behind this were determined to make it a genocide. Why? Because genocide is the, the crime that invalidates one's existence. If you're guilty of genocide, you don't get to exist, right? That's, that's how the, the thinking goes. It, it worked in Rwanda, right? You ask the current government and they'll tell you, yeah, uh, we, we're, the, we're the survivors of genocide and our opposition is existing at our sufferance. I'm not justifying anything the Hutus did, I'm just saying try talking to a Hutu in Rwanda. My point being that the ICTY set out to make this a genocide at all costs and basically defined it, whatever facts they could stitch together to fit Redefine, change the definition to fit whatever facts they were able to prove, and that's not very many. And the, because, and this is what not, not a lot of people remember, from day one, almost, of the Bosnian War, which was fought much like the Lebanese Civil War, over the concept of who's going to be in charge of the country, because you had three communities that coexisted based on a very precarious sort of an ethnic key and quota system, that you know you had to have one of each and, and rotating and, and power sharing and then one of these communities basically said no we don't think we're going to abide by this we're the majority we're the most numerous we're going to rule over everybody else that's how the war, that's why the war started that's how the war started i'll die on this hill and from day one the bosnian muslims who later renamed themselves bosniaks their leader, Ali Izabegovic, his strategy from day one was to get an international intervention. And his model was Desert Storm, Kuwait 1991. Kuwait didn't really resist Iraq. The Iraqis just basically walked Rolled in. in. <laughs> and then the Kuwaiti government in exile was like, okay, please defend us, you know, please fight the war for us, and came up with all of these propaganda uh, tricks like the incubator babies. The United States assembles a coalition, deploys this massive army in the Middle East, and then invades and ends the war in two weeks. That was the idea. You, we, we, we get the Americans to do the same thing for us. It was basically just spelled out. That was a strategy all along. Well, there are, I mean, there are a number of sources that claim that, that is, is a Begovic, which was the, he was the, the Bosniak um, uh, leader, uh, a, a, a Nazi and um, a religious fundamentalist who, I mean, there are a num number of sources who, who have explicitly stated that he told them that if 5,000 Muslims were killed in Srebrenica, this would lead to NATO intervention. I, I think one of, the, one of the sources was the Srebrenica chief of police. Yes. Mehud who was himself a Muslim, who, yeah. who lived to tell the tale. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of trying to rewind to like 1992, sure. because from the very start of the conflict, you had atrocity propaganda as one of the key uh, uh, pillars of strategy from Sarajevo. And they've tried everything from the infamous uh, concentration camp pictures that basically they found one man who was uh, and wasting, yeah, yeah. He was wasting disease. They positioned him outside of the chicken wire, shot, uh, re reverse shot at it, and then basically declared this is you know Bergen Belsen ninety two. Mm. And tr they've tried everything. Neither the ICTY nor the ICJ agreed to any of this. Basically, the only instance of genocide that they could ever conjure into being mm. was Srebrenica. And this is what people forget, because again, like in 92, 93, there was talk of genocide all over the place, and this was, this was a key pillar of propaganda from Sarajevo to cause an international military intervention. The irony is that when Srebrenica happened, when the enclave was taken by Ser Bosnian Serb troops in July of 1995, that was already the middle of this big push 
by the U.S., specifically the U.S., and uh, the Croatian military, which the American diplomats at the time called our junkyard dogs, uh, to attack the Serbs in Krajina and basically obliterate these UN protected areas. Mm. That, was, that was about to happen in August. So nobody made a big fuss about Srebrenica at the time because it was inconvenient for their narrative. And it, in fact, this didn't become a thing until pretty much after the Dayton Peace Agreement was signed. Because you, you look at the transcripts and testimonies from Dayton, Srebrenica isn't even brought up. The Bosnian Muslims aren't asking for it back. They're asking for a land bridge to Gorazde, which is the only remaining Muslim-majority enclave on the Drina. They're asking for land around Sarajevo. They're asking for all these other things. But they're not asking for Serbia. It's not an issue for them at the time. It, has, it became an issue afterwards. Why? Because the, the American elections were over, the 12-month you know, uh, the, the mandate of the peacekeeping troops had expired, uh, Serbia was being set up for the 99 bombing because the team at the State Department wanted to finish the job. And so let's find a pretext to revise the Dayton Accords and invalidate them. You have the U.S. Embassy today saying Bosnia is not a union of two states. A Republic of Srpska only exists at Bosnia's sufferance. This is literally a misreading of the Dayton Peace Accord because the Dayton Peace Accords literally say otherwise. But again, we're, 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 we're look, you, you see who, who we're dealing with. We're dealing with people who are intentionally misreading their own treaties because they have no intention of abiding by them. And they needed a way to invalidate the existence of Republika Srpska because it was written down in an internationally binding agreement. Mm. And this was 30 years ago, so they weren't quite as willing as they are today to just simply trample the laws they don't, they don't like. It, they, there, there's been a road that took them there by now. Of course, today, nobody would, buy, would bat an eye at the U.S. violating wantonly international law because it does that and doesn't bat an eye. But 30 years ago, this was still a no-no. Why did they do this now? Isn't it obvious? Gaza. Obviously. And... and, and the, the, the saddest part of it all, the most horrifying in my mind, is that all of these Muslim-majority countries that voted in favor literally said, we absolutely understand that why you're doing this. You're, you're, you're tossing us a distraction from Gaza. We're, but we're going to keep objecting to what you're doing in Gaza and what you're supporting in Gaza and we're going to vote for this anyway because religious solidarity. I, I feel bad for them because they're being taken for a ride. They're being used. But I, you know, I can't make decisions for them. That's their sovereign right if they want to be stupid about this. I'm just disappointed. But at the end of the day, minus these countries that literally spelled out that they're being cynical, the, the division came down to the globalist American empire and satellites on one side and the rest of the world on the other. And even though people who were behind this are publicly celebrating this as a victory, it should be ringing alarm bells from Brussels to Washington because it literally split the UN along the lines that they didn't want them to be split. Because it's a clear message was sent because the Chinese and the Russians are usually far more diplomatic about this, and a lot of other countries, like Nicaragua, gave a really, really fiery speech about, you know, who are you to lecture us about genocides? You had, you had several other countries who were very much, uh, you know, they, just about everybody who spoke in the General Assembly was like, we see what you're trying to do. And they said it publicly. And this is the kind of sunlight that this kind of plot absolutely does not abide. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm not quite willing to um, go along with President Vucic's narrative that this was a great victory, because it wasn't. But it was absolutely, at best, a Pyrrhic victory for the empire, because 
the key to its global hegemony is for the people being hegemonized uh, never to realize what's being done. They must be unknowingly going along. And at, at best, you've had people knowingly going along with, with this ploy and telling the entire world about it. And that's not how this empire works. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, in, in, funnily enough, like the, in the UN vote on the US intervention in Iraq, in Iraq in nineteen nineteen ninety, um, <clears throat> the, the two countries that voted against it was Cuba and Yemen, and the US ambassador told the Yemeni ambassador that's the most expensive vote you'll ever cast, and then severely punished them economically as a result for daring to step out of line. Do you think who's that... laughing now, <laughs> considering that the Yemenis have single-handedly checkmated the entire global shipping industry, or rather, let me revise that, Western global shipping industry, mm. because last I checked, the Russian-owned or Chinese-owned vessels had absolutely no problem going through the Red Sea or past the Houthis, and anything British, American, NATO, or Israeli is still being blocked or attacked by missiles if they dare sail anywhere near there. I mean, how's that prosperity guardian operation working for you? I mean, it's not prospering. So. Well, but, but he, he's one of those, yes, the, the American ambassador, famous last words. You know, this is going to cost you dearly. Thirty, you know, forty years later, who's laughing now? Yeah. I mean, these things have a way of coming around, which, which, you know, yes, okay, the Washington establishment is a historical, and and they and they always think, oh, it's going to be different this time, uh, and it never is different, is it? Never. Um, I mean, we, we've just had uh, Karim Khan, who is the um, a, 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 a ICC prosecutor, the ICC being uh, an ad hoc successor to the uh, uh, criminal tri tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, and w w which which Khan worked on. Um, he's admit um, he 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 said in a TV interview that um, he was threatened to not go after Netanyahu, and that the the ICC is for Africans and for thugs like. Putin, um, not the West and its uh, its assorted puppets and proxies. Um, I mean, this seems to uh, this this seems to be the ethos. Does it not still? Right. Well, I mean, it's the whole point of the rules based world order that you know those who make the rules don't are above the law. Uh, mm. Which again, the, most of the rest of the world has figured out and is not necessarily willing to go along with anymore. Uh, the sheer amount of self-delegitimization that the American Empire, the globalist mm -hmm. American Empire, has done over the past month alone, is baffling to me. Like the whole, let's have a, let's have a, let, let, put it this way: the UN General Assembly recently voted overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly, to back Palestinian statehood and admission to and, and UN membership. Just overwhelmingly. And the U.S. goes, no, no, you can't do that. Uh, we don't recognize your vote. We're going to veto it in the Security Council. And uh, this shouldn't be done unilaterally. Any Palestinian statehood needs to be a, uh, a result of a negotiated se settlement between Israel and the Palestinians. Noble sentiment, except that Moscow asked, wait a second, where was the negotiated settlement in case of Kosovo? There wasn't one because the U.S. just decided to unilaterally declare its conquered territory an mm. independent state. And then when the International Court of Justice was asked about it, very specifically by Serbia, it changed the question. What people don't realize is that, you know, 2007-8, when this came up, uh, Serbia sent to the UN a request to seek a clarifying opinion from the ICJ and actually got approval in the General Assembly of all things. And they sent the question, you know, was it, was it appropriate and legal for the provisional government acting under UN Resolution uh, 1244 to declare independence. And the International Court of Justice, which some African judges later publicly admitted that, that committed a slight, judicial sleight of hand is, is how they called it, basically said, well, if it's a provisional government acting under UN authority, clearly no, because it's illegal. But we're going to call them a group of citizens instead and say that that's strictly speaking not illegal. And this is how the International Court of Justice, which is actually a legitimate international court, under tremendous US pressure, arm twisting and the like, ruled that Kosovo's independence was legal. It wasn't. They literally redefined the question so the answer would be yes. 
Now you have the ICC, which is a bastard child of ICTY, which actually does have an internationally recognized statute. Like it's, it's a proper court in the sense that there's a treaty that countries have signed up on, uh, signed up to. Except, who are the countries that did not sign the treaty? Russia, for one. Ukraine. Israel. The US. Who did sign to the Rome Statute? The Palestinian Authority. So by the actual rules that the West should be obligated to accept because they're their own rules, the ICC has jurisdiction over the West Bank and Gaza. Whether you like it or not, that's the rules. And now the US is saying, well, you know, you don't have the you don't have jurisdiction because because Israel, because we say so. I'm sorry, but those are your own rules. And just like you never issue an order you know cannot be obeyed because that destroys your authority, you cannot claim to be an enforcer of laws and rules if you don't if you don't want to abide by them yourself. You're a crooked cop then. Yeah, good analogy. I, I mean, I, I think as well that, that there was a um, uh, there was a February nineteen ninety three CIA memo which explicitly proposed creating um, a, a war crimes tribunal um, for the purpose of publicising Serbian atrocities, and it and it very explicitly warned against um, uh, even mentioning uh, Bosniak transgressions. Um, and I think that this has helped further and cement this notion that the, the Bosniaks were the Jews in the Holocaust or like the, the, the Palestinians, um, uh, just completely innocent victims of, of um, Serb imperialism and genocide. Um, I mean, what, what's your take on the, the notion that the entire war was genocidal in nature, which some people claim? No, it's absurd. It wasn't. The war was not genocidal in nature. It was a sectarian conflict in fought over land, not even on the principles who's going to govern the country, because um, the, the thing that they agreed on, that all sides agreed on in the end, is to partition it. That's what the Dayton Peace Agreement is. It's a, it's a demarcation of border. And the Bosnian Muslims, for all of their insistence otherwise, accepted the idea of, of ethnic partition and yeah. ethnic sovereignty. They did. It's in the treaty. Uh, so that... Bosnia's independence as such was never really in question. Mm. Uh, the only question was whether Bosnia would exist as a state or would, would it bro break up into independent statelets. And what the Dayton Agreement did in the end was say, okay, fine, you can have sort of a general outline of a, of a state uh, and then you can have your ethnic statelets functioning inside it. The fact that one side couldn't get their ethnic statelet to function isn't really relevant to the text of the treaty. That's a you problem, as, as, as we say in the business. But, the, again, the whole accusation of genocide was a pillar of propaganda, of, of strategy, to get the West involved in the war. It's, it's an objectively true fact. And so the talk of genocide was furthering that ambition. And the fact that the ICTY was explicitly founded to put the Serbs on trial and all the other prosecutions were ancillary at best. And most of those, uh, first of all, they went after local commanders and, and junior officials. The few senior officials that they put on trial were accused of uh, the equivalent of a speeding ticket. I mean, mm. you've, you've got people, you know, of all the atrocities, for example, that the Bosnian Muslim military committed, they put its commanding general on trial for executions of a handful of Croatian prisoners. Mm. It was, it, it's, I think, mean, war crimes against Serbian civilians, according to the ICTY, didn't happen. Um, you know, it, it, essentially, like, the, the Croats were convicted of attacking Muslims. Muslims were convicted, if ever, of maybe attacking Croats. Mm. Serbs were convicted of everything, and no attack on Serbs ever was punished. It's, it's how the ICTY mm. uh, judgments came down. I, better lawyers than me and more recognized legal authorities have argued pretty convincingly that the ICTY was illegitimate mm. because the Security Council that created it that rubber stamped the CIA yeah. proposal to create it, had no judiciary powers to delegate. Yeah. 
It's also part of the UN constitution that they, they can't make courts, isn't it? Right. So, <coughs> they, and they just violated that and made a court anyway, mm -hmm. because they said, oh, well, these are, you know, extraordinary circumstances. Well, you would think that that would mean you have to do better in extraordinary circumstances, but no. And they did the same thing with Rwanda. It, and, and for a while there, uh, there, the Obama administration went with this whole, there are genocides everywhere and we're the knight in shining armor that's going around the world ending them. Sort of a retcon of World War II history and the role of the American empire in the world. But I don't think the people who wrote that actually believe their own BS. Maybe they, they eventually came to believe, you know, drink their own, drink their own Kool-Aid and believe their own propaganda. But it was cynical from the get go. Because again, if you define everything as genocide, nothing really is. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, on the subject of, uh, of uh, crimes against Serbs not being prosecuted, uh, you have Nasser Oric, uh, who was a uh, Bosniak military commander, who had this fearsome reputation for taking no prison mm -hmm. prisoners, torturing, mutilating and murdering uh, prisoners of war and uh, uh, civilians alike. Uh, and used Srebrenica as a staging post um, for, for attacks on on Serb villages, including on Orthodox Christmas, which you know went down really well um, with uh, with the Serbs. Um, but yeah, like he showed um, Western journalists videos of um, his quote unquote greatest hits, like you know, like beheaded um, uh, beheaded Serbs, uh, the, the pe people that they killed with explosives, people they've like skewered on spikes and grilled. Um, on, on, um, uh, on, on spits, and then at the ICTY, he was. Um, uh, what was his? What was he tried for? I believe um, he was put on trial for torturing. For it was in, inhumane treatment of right. prisoners. It was. He, he was. He was charged with not stopping the inhumane treatment of prisoners. Yes. That underlings committed. Mm. It's, it's one of those, are you kidding me? But then again, you know, I, I hold that the ICUI is legitimate and I'm not surprised that, that he was eventually acquitted and yeah. released for lack of evidence. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because, again, we're, what we're dealing with is, and Orange's case is, is interesting because, he has, as, as you said, I've, I've read the uh, Greatest Hits article myself back in the day and uh, I'm amazed that all of these Western journalists who wrote this and witnessed this very elegantly memory hold it and pretend it never happened. Yeah. Well, there, I mean, How there do they a, sleep sorry. at night? I don't know. But <laughs> On top of a pile of money. Yeah, um, but Oric, um, Oric was actually evacuated from Srebrenica months ahead of July 11th. Mm. The most interesting part, well, one of the most interesting parts, because another one just came up recently, courtesy of some British documents, is that Oric and the entire command of the 28th Division were airlifted mm. by helicopters secretly uh, ahead of time. It, it's, it's almost as if the leadership in Sarajevo knew that something was about to happen or had prepared for something to happen and they wanted to pull them out and leave the division without both without command but also save these people for something else in the future. Mm. And they literally airlifted the entire leadership and left these people to fend for themselves. Yeah. That's, that's one really interesting detail that nobody's ever explained. Yeah. The other one is apparently there was a SAS team present on the ground that even the Dutch peacekeepers that were charged with safeguarding the, the UN protected area were leery of and were basically kept at arm's length from and these people came and went. Uh, on their own, they, they were not reporting to anybody, they were basically operating on London's orders, and the Dutch were completely in the dark. Yeah. And and they would sometimes go out and you know maybe join Oryx's people, we don't know. Mm. And they had these you know, classified reports that have just recently surfaced, courtesy of certain investigative journalists, um, that you know don't clarify what they were doing, but they were definitely up to something. I, 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 you know, I, I'm loath to believe that they were out there for the you know, bird watching and picking flowers. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so, I mean, form, formally, their, their, their task was was intelligence gathering, and yet there, you have this Dutch government report which states that, that the 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 Dutch peacekeepers were scared of the British and thought that they could start World War Three, um, which is a rather strange appraisal if the, all they were doing was um, gathering intelligence. And yet, that there is also, um, as I've reported on, um, a declassified Ministry of Defence file wh where it, where they openly talk about. Um, I think it was it was about. A month before the 
uh, the attack on Srebrenica happened, the the the, the MI MI six um, felt that it, that believed that a a strike was coming from Serb forces on Srebrenica. I mean, this is bef many weeks before this uh, the, the the attack on Srebrenica was actually planned. Um, well, obviously, the, the, the evacuation of the command staff would have been their first clue. Even the MI6 couldn't miss that. Yeah, yeah. and it's like that. Uh, I mean, there's also you have a, a Bosniak MP who was the, the uh, a founding member of the uh, the SDA, which is the the uh, the is, is it Begovic's party. party, and 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 who was from Srebrenica, who opened the party's local branch there. Um, and in 1996, he told the Sarajevo newspaper. The betrayal of Srebrenica was consciously prepared by the Bosnian presidency and the army command. Many more inhabitants of Srebrenica would be alive today if I was not prevented by a group of criminals. Oric's actions were, he declared, a conscious giving of a pretext to Serb forces to attack. Because this was a Muslim-majority enclave surrounded on all sides by enemy, uh, by, by enemy territory. And it was basically undefended. Um, so, I mean, when you, it, it, it was, it seems to have been well understood that using it as a staging post, particularly for extremely brutal um, attacks on civilians, was going to lead to an absolutely brutal um, counterattack. I mean, Marillon, who I mentioned, apparently warned, claims to have warned uh, Milosevic in 1993 that this would happen and the Serbs will be, become demons um, well, as a result. So, so <coughs> that, that's, it's a good thing you mentioned this. So, 93 is when this big battle in eastern Bosnia happens along the Drina and the Muslim forces are pretty much decisively defeated. And they're, uh, they basically end up in these three enclaves, Srebrenica, Zepa and Gorazde. And the UN acting as it did at the time, basically gets through with humanitarian aid and food supplies and finds all these soldiers and, you know, um, uh, uh, troops and farmers and civilians and says, okay, well, you know, we, can, we can evacuate the civilians to safety uh, because one thing people don't understand, perhaps, is that at the, at the very early stages of the war in Bosnia, you had certain towns uh, evacuated by the local authorities. For example, I uh, personally heard stories of Bosnian Muslims getting evacuated, like the, S the SDA party organizing evacuations from certain towns uh, because they were Serb majority, they had no aspirations to control them, they had no hope of holding them. So like, okay, get on the bus, we're going to, you know, Bosnian territory, you're all becoming refugees. And people were like, well, I mean, I don't want to get killed, so I better flee to safety. <laughs> and there, there was a mass amount of movement of people in the early days because people were like, well, we'll just, we'll just leave for a few weeks until this boils over and see what happens, and then they end up getting stuck. So the UN, Morion specifically, says, well, I, why don't we just evacuate the civilians? And Orich says, no. Yeah, they were prevented from doing Nobody so. Nobody is leaving. <clears throat> They all must stay here. And Mario's like, well, how, 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 how are you going to feed them? Oh, you will feed us. The whole concept was keeping these people there because if you keep them there, you keep the territory. Because if you evacuate them, you become a military target. And then, of course, you're fair game for, for, for a battle. He, Orish was literally using these people as human shields, which was what appalled Mario, among other people. But what happens is the UN is like, okay, we're going to set up six protected areas for civilians, uh, the three in eastern Bosnia, and then Tuzla, Sarajevo, and Bihać. All six are Bosnian Muslim strongholds. Tuzla, Sarajevo, and Bihać specifically are core headquarters, something like 10,000 troops each. And essentially, you, you set up bases for the Bosnian Muslim military to attack from with impunity and they cannot be pursued into them because the UN troops are uh, set around the perimeter. And you've got NATO patrolling the skies because it was originally supposed to protect the no-fly zone that was created on a false pretext because the Bosnian Croats shot down an Italian humanitarian plane and they blamed the Serbs. So NATO must do something, no-fly zone. Uh, so you've got NATO, which is, has helpfully offered to enforce this for the UN, usurping the UN's power, which was a sort of an ongoing thing throughout the Bosnian War, saying, oh, we'll do this, we'll enforce this, we'll bomb the ground targets. First wartime mission in the alliance's history ever. 
And so you've basically got a, this, this creeping intervention. The, the, the greatest irony, and I know I'm jumping all over the place, but the greatest irony is that Zizabegovich eventually got what he, was look, what he was asking for, just not in the way he envisioned. And it, it ended up the West using him because if you read Holbrook's memoirs from Dayton, and Holbrook an was an interesting character. He, he was not a nice guy, he was not a good man, but he never tried to lie to protect his reputation. He mm. was a bit of a thug, and he told you what he thought, because he was very like, full, Very full for right. Oh, yeah. I was like, I hate you, and I'm gonna tell you about it, because what can you do? All right, I respect that. And so in his memoirs, he's literally, outlining the greatest success of the Dayton Peace Agreement is that the U.S. Has, has reasserted its dominance in Europe again. Oh, wait a second, I thought your mission was to end the war and the bloodshed. Oh yeah, no, that too. <laughs> but like, the whole point of the U.S. involvement was to keep the, the Europeans in their designated place in this new world order, to, to, to sideline the U.N., you know, to, to cozy up to the Muslim world that was angry after the first Iraq war. And, and they thought they accomplished all of this. And in fact, as Brendan O'Neill pointed out uh, many years later, it literally globalized jihad from Afghanistan because that wrapped up in 1992 with the fall of the Soviet-backed government, which held on for like, what is it, three, four years yeah. before, the, before the Mujahideen took, uh, dis destroyed it yeah. and then started fighting between each other. And all of a sudden, all of these Western encouraged Jihadists from all over the place, such as freedom fighter Osama bin Laden, on the road, the uh, warrior uh, on the road to a peace. A Bosnian citizen, yes. Um, <laughs> they're like, well, what are we going to do next? Oh, here's Bosnia. And guess what? The Western propaganda, which is intended to hype up Western audiences, uh, Europeans and Americans, for intervention and failed, has, this, has created this narrative about, you know, the West not doing anything to defend innocent weak Muslims from, from weak evil Serbs committing genocide against them and literally, literally radicalized tens of thousands of jihadists. I believe Majid Nawaz actually said that he was radicalized by, by uh, stories of the Bosnian genocide and then joined the, was it the Muslim Brotherhood yeah. and then ended up in, in prison and ended up seeing the error of his ways. But like, you've, you've literally got testimonials from people who, who fell for this. Whereas the Western, the, the Americans didn't get in much of an appetite for military intervention. The Western Europeans certainly didn't have much of an appetite. And their governments were really pushing for this because that would give them some kind of, you know, legitimacy as knights in shining armor. But again, that propaganda horrendously backfired and we ended up getting 9-11. We ended up getting the, the, the Taliban again yeah. and, and the whole Afghanistan fiasco and the second Iraq invasion and ISIS. Um, and All of this can be traced to the 1990s. To this, you know, propaganda that I don't think inflamed the jihadists on purpose, but that was its effect. Because yeah. I think it was intended to propagandize the Western audience, the Western public opinion, to get on board with this imperialist agenda, which you know, Kagan and Crystal in ninety six ninety five def defined as benevolent global hegemony uh, forever. But they were they were thinking, you know, they were making policy recommendations for Clinton. Like this is this this was you know the, these are neocons. They're advising Democrats because empire is a bipartisan issue. So, but by the time Zbigniewicz gets his intervention in 95, he's been used. He's no longer necessary. And his cause, the idea that he's going to control all of Bosnia and bring back the Ottoman Empire of 1876, is not interesting anymore. Americans have achieved their goal, they're gonna, they're gonna stop, they're gonna consolidate their gains, and they're gonna push later after the election, after Bill Clinton gets reelected. And he got a worse deal than any yeah, prior absolutely. Uh, he uh, peace got, proposal. He um, would have gotten a much better <coughs> deal in March 1992, because the EU proposed plan had Bosnia independent, which was a big concession for the Serbs and Croats. Huge, yeah. Uh, but also partitioned in these three ethnic provinces, and by this partition, the Muslims would have gotten a lot more land. Yeah. I believe under the current arrangement, they controlled like something like 23% of the entire of the country's entire territory. Mm. The Serbs are at 49 or a little less because of some border changes yeah. by the American viceroys later. But and the Croats 
control disproportionate share uh, to their population, but that's again, that's a federation problem. Uh, but the, the Muslims got a raw deal, but this is what they wanted. That's the monkey's paw they got with their wish. But perhaps most, the worst thing that happened to them, and I've on, I'm on record uh, writing this over many, many years, it's not the land issue that's, the, that's, that's really the rough part. It's that they ended up as a collective, as an, as an ethnos, defined by Yusubegovich's wartime narrative and propaganda. They loathe his family. Like his son, who eventually took over the party, he ended up getting metaphorically run out of town on a rail because his wife was so corrupt that they wouldn't give her the time of day. She ruined medicine in, in the Muslim-controlled part of Bosnia. Uh, but they don't have the stomach for him or his family. But his father's no concept of who they are as a people is, is considered sacred. The, th the three people who sat on behalf of Bosnia illegally because by the Bosnian constitution, this had to be a consensus decision of the presidency, and the Serbs did not consent. But the three people who sat in the UN celebrating this were once members of the Social Democrats, which was a party that uh, was a successor to the communists. And they were all theoretically declared uh, non-nationalist, secular, modernist, civic society types. And yet here they are enforcing Isabegovic's vision. That is the truly horrifying, because that vision is extremely negative. This, this self-definition that they've embraced, by for, that was forced on them by their own leadership, is, is rooted in hatred and grievance. It's, it's not a positive identity, it's, a, it's an extremely negative identity. It keeps them unhappy, it keeps them poor, it, it keeps them crooked, in thrall of crooked politicians mm. who are looting them. And it offers zero ability to connect with their neighbors. Basically, the only way out of this is if the Serbs and Croats magically disappear overnight. They lack the, they lack the force to do this, so they're hoping somebody else will do it for them. Whether it's the West, or it's the, it's the Turks, or the Arabs, or, some, or the Iranians, or somebody else. But this is this is this is you know, this is their vision of the future, and it's a bleak one, and it's it explains why they're constantly miserable. What do you think? What do you think is the future of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina and R Republika Srpska? I mean, what I what I would prefer to happen is for the people, all three communities, to see reason and realize that they have to live with each other, either as good neighbors across some really short good fences or as frenemies over some longer, taller fences, but that their neighbors aren't going anywhere. Mm. And to have a little bit of dignity, as opposed to you know, rushing to lick the boot of every conqueror that comes along. And you know who you are, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna spell it out. But you know, what's, what's going to happen most likely, and this, this is what I would like to see, but this is what's probably going to happen, because I can recognize likelihoods and probabilities, is that Republika Srpska is going to say, okay, the Bosnian Muslims, the Bosniaks, have just demonstrated to us that they don't abide by the Constitution, they don't abide by the Dayton Peace Accord, they don't want to live with us, they hate us, so we're leaving. We have our state, they have their rump, whatever, we're just, we're just, we're just leaving. Our now goal is a union with Serbia. You can't do that! It's going to be the scream from the American Embassy. Why exactly? Oh, the Dayton Agreement. You mean the one that you were violating? <laughs> the one that the Bosnian Muslims refuse to abide by? And are trying to destroy. Right. Yeah. Um, so so <clears throat> what, do you, what do you propose to do? Sanction them harder? Bomb them again? With what military? Have you checked your stockpiles lately? Yeah, well, I mean, I think uh, on um, uh, Republic of Serbia's um, Independence uh, Day, uh, they were ha they were uh, there was a, there was a, a public celebration, and there was like one F thirty five fighter jet like hovering menacingly above. I mean, of course, they didn't care. <laughs> like, I mean, people on the ground. Um, yeah, I mean, do, I mean, do, w w what could the empire do? Sanctions? No. Well, the problem is that objectively, to us who have who are aware of 
the actual state of affairs in the world and you know the the military power and power projection algorithms and all of this stuff, it's obvious that the empire doesn't have the wherewithal to enforce its writ like the way it did 30 years ago. However, the problem is the empire doesn't understand this. And in this post-truth world order, it doesn't matter what is, it matters what people think is. Mm -hmm. Now, again, there a lot a lot can fit into this gap between wishful thinking and reality. But the biggest problem right now is that have you ever watched those Wiley e. Coyote and Roadrunner cartoons? <laughs> yes. You know that there's a delay between Coyote running over a cliff and hovering in the air yeah. and him realizing that there's nothing beneath him? <laughs> we haven't hit the point where he realizes there's nothing between him and drops down. But he's, he's already running in empty air across, mm. over a cliff. And this is, this is the situation we're in right now. And by we, I mean the globe, I mean humanity. The globalist American empire has run off the cliff and is about to look down and realize there's nothing beneath me. But they haven't done that yet. They still think that they're the you know, richest, strongest, most powerful, most legitimate, you name it, they think so of themselves. They are not aware of their own limitations. And so they're going to act irrationally, stupidly, and destructively. They can still do harm. They, they cannot create the world as they wish it to be, but they can hurt a lot of people in the process. They can go out swinging. Right. And so... So far, the Serb strategy was to sit and wait and, you know, adopt the Taliban approach in the sense of, you know, we've got the watches, we've got the time, because we live here, we've always lived here, and you're just the latest in the series of conquerors we've seen off. Mm. You know, ask today, where is the Ottoman Empire or Austria-Hungary or the Nazi Reich? Mm. All of whom have done damage, tremendous damage, but they're gone. So will the globalist American Empire be one day. But again, the empire is stupid enough to keep provoking and pushing and prodding and, and forcing some kind of confrontation because it wants one, because it thinks it can win it. It can't. But again, they're too daft to realize it yet and therein lies the problem. And on that bombshell, um, yeah, we've taken up enough of your time as it is, I think. Um, no, but thank you very much for coming on Active Measures. Um, always a pleasure, never a burden. Thank you very God much bless for you. having me. Hey everyone, um, if you enjoyed this video or, or any of our other content, uh, please give us a follow on Twitter or subscribe to us on YouTube. It will help us beat the algorithm oligarchs. Thank you.